So I was going to talk about safety in general. And I actually have two different presentations about this, which I've developed recently. Um, one of them is a bit depressing, though, because it's mostly about planes crashing. And if you want to watch that one, you can go look at my Go to Chicago talk. And it's, kind of, it's an interesting talk, but I'll, and I sort of a little, I thought in the end that uh, I wanted to do this one. This is a talk I, it's a cut down version of a talk I gave last Friday at the first Chaos Engineering Conference. And um, I think it's topical and it brings up some of the same subjects, but it's uh, shortened and get, trying to give you an overview of so what is this thing about? Where's it coming from? Why does this matter? Uh, and where are we going? And uh, it really comes down to answering a couple of questions. Like, we have, we're building computer systems now which run stuff that keeps people alive and that keeps companies alive. And that means that dollars turn up at ADP to cut you a paycheck occasionally and things like that. And it would be really bad if something we did in, in our computer systems stopped that because then people wouldn't get paid or they might die or businesses might go out of business. So that's, it's getting more and more critical. And it's at AWS, we're getting people shutting data centers and moving everything over to us. And we're going, ah, we have to make sure we do this right. So that's kind of my motivation for getting into this space. It's something I've been working on for a long time. But if something fails, you really got, you know, there's three choices. One of them is like collapse in a heap, right? Or blow up, which is like the choice we don't really want. But the two choices that you, you really want to happen is you either stop because you're not sure what to do next and it's best to just stop, or try to carry on with some kind of reduced functionality. Right? You want to cover up the fact that something failed. Right? Or, but if you can't, then you have to decide are you going to stop or not. Um, and I, I like to ask people this question. Do you have a backup data center? Who here has a backup data center somewhere in their business? Right. Yeah, a few of you. I mean, I, I do this talk at uh, a lot of enterprise -y customers, and then they go, well, how often do you fail over apps to it? And you, then people start looking a bit shifty. And well, once a year, the regulator makes us do that. OK, that's probably a reasonable answer. Um, and how often do you fail over the whole data center at once? Is, well, there was that time when Hurricane Sandy flooded it, and it turns out they don't work underwater. <laughs> and then when the water goes away, they don't work when they're full of sand and bits of seaweed either. So. Yeah, that was a good, tr and then you spend a little while freaking out and trying to build a new data center. Um, and I, I call this availability theater, because it's like taking your shoes off at the airport. You spent all that money on a backup data center, and it's, it's there to satisfy the regulators and tick a box. It doesn't really give you a lot of benefit. Um, so we have this nice fairy tale that, w that we subscribe to, that once upon a time, in theory, if everything works perfectly, we have a plan to survive the disasters we thought of in advance. Okay. And it's, you know, like fairy tales, you read them at bedtime, it's not a great bedtime story because it tends to keep people up at night rather than have them go to sleep. So, not a good thing. Um, I just got a few examples here. This is one from last year. Forgot to renew domain name. Now think about your company. How much of your company would work if the domain name disappeared off the internet and was no longer connected to your machines? Right? This happened to a large SaaS vendor last year who was also recently purchased, so you can probably remember who it was. Um, not good. Like, well, it was basically the only way this company had to communicate at that point was the CEO was on Twitter, apologizing. Lots of social media skills training happened that day. Um, <laughs> and until they assume a day or two, the impact took several days to clean up, right? So just think about attacks on DNS are probably the fastest and easiest way to take down pretty much any organization in the modern world because we're all online, right? So think about how you make your DNS resilient would be where I'd start if you're worried about things like that happening, and you should be. This is something that's happened to just about everybody who's ever run a system. So it's time out, keels over, oops. Yep, uh, happens, happened to me multiple times. This is my buddy in Jersey City. Yep, not, not good. And then, you know, tomorrow, I actually was talking to somebody from Delta Airlines like two days before their data center went down. Yep, it can happen to you tomorrow. Um, so, this is a, this, so what can you do about it? And it, it's really difficult to enumerate every possible thing that might go wrong. You should try to get good coverage, but Chris Pinkham built the first version of EC2 for AWS a decade or so ago. And he, I was on a, talking to him at a, an event oh, many, many years ago, and he said, this is what they focused on, and this is what AWS tries to focus on. Right. Fast detection and response, 
I don't care what goes wrong. As long as I can detect something has gone wrong and I can mobilize people to fix it, I can figure out exactly what went wrong later. Well, we'll try and guard against the obvious stuff, but it's the, it, it, you, it's the stuff you didn't see that will get you. And you think, okay, well, we should automate that. There was a problem with automation, and there's this nice phrase called synoptic illegibility, right? So most people haven't heard of this phrase. It comes out of this book by Sidney Decker. What it basically means is you cannot actually write down how it works. That's that you cannot legibly write a legible synopsis for the actual process by which a thing works. It means you can't automate it. It means you have to have human judgment for catching all the exceptions and the actual way it works. And a lot of safety manuals claim to be the manual and you follow this process, but it turns out the way real safety happens in real companies has lots of human judgment and deviations from the rules are actually how you become safe. And so the times when people say, well, they didn't follow them at the safety manual, and that's why it went wrong, it's usually the opposite. The things went wrong because they were following. If you, if you work to rule, everything stops and breaks. It's one of those things. So this is an interesting concept. And here's another interesting paper. The network is reliable. Of course, it isn't, and that's the point. This is the first fallacy of distributed systems. Um, and you can, we're building distributed systems now, and you have to assume the network will go wrong. Either the naming system, which is DNS, or the connections, or something will go wrong. Um, and then there's this interesting concept. You can do everything right at every step along the way. You can make a completely defensible decision given all the information you were supposed to have and it will still go wrong. Uh, this, is, this is the basis of that other talk I gave you which is mostly about planes crashing. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, it's all depressing. Um, and uh, here's another interesting book. The first version of this book was the book that I passed around a lot at Netflix. We ended up building circuit breakers that got open sourced, got a lot of uh, awareness, bulkhead circuit breakers. How do you contain failure in, in a distributed system? Uh, and there's some new ideas in here which I'll get to later because I had some conversations with Michael um, while he was writing this book and some of those ideas came in. All right, who knows what Greenspun's 10th rule is? Right. You know that there are, in fact, no rules one to nine. Right. Probably some of you know Philip Greenspan. But um, this is the tenth rule, and you've seen variations of this around. Right? Any sufficiently complicated C or Fortran program contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden, slow implementation of half of, mod of common list. Right? And the point we're making here is, 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 is something that I think is, is interesting. Developers will ignore all current practice and whatever, like, I can figure this out. I'm going to make some stuff up. I'm going to redefine terms that have common definitions. I'm going to just going to invent stuff and assume that because I can figure, because I'm used to making things up, I'll do that. And it's because, I don't know, maybe there's a sort of genetic inability to read manuals or books or something. <laughs> but what, what I'm, you know, as one of the old gray haired guys that's been around for a long time, um, what I wanted to do with this talk, and this was, you know, the more detailed version of this was to like a room full of chaos engineering people, was like, try not to reinvent stuff. There's some things out there you can build off of, and uh, there's some existing practices and things. But, you know, so, so this is a get off your, get off my lawn kind of talk, if you like. Um, so, this is the definition from the principles of chaos engineering. The discipline of experimenting in a distributed system in order to build confidence and the system's capacity to withstand turbulent conditions in production, and that's a bit of a mouthful. So I think I'm just going to highlight a few bits. It's experimenting. So chaos engineering is about running experiments. Uh, you're trying to build confidence. And then this capacity to withstand turbulent conditions. Okay, how do you define a turbulent condition and capacity to withstand? So I think we need to simplify this a little bit. So I'm going to basically rewrite this to be we're trying to run experiments to ensure it's a bit stronger than, you know, build confidence. And what we're really trying to do is mitigate the impact of failures. We want something to go wrong and no one to notice. All right, that's fundamentally it. The, the, um, the title of that other talk I gave about planes question was called Dynamic Non-Events. You want there to be non-events under dynamic conditions where things happening, stuff's going wrong, and you want it to cause a non-event, not an event. Right? That's a mitigation. Right? So if we think about failures, what went wrong, what kind of thing failed. So that's what failures are fairly, you know, that's an easy thing to get your head around. That's why I like that word. And then the impact of the failure is separate. 
What mitigation mechanisms do you have in place? How do you deal with failures? Like it, coming here, you know, um, let me see, our flight to Boston was delayed by a few hours, but we still got here, right? That was fine. Um, people who are driving here, you get a flat tire, you have a, you have a spare tire or you have AAA, you have a cell phone, you have ways to recover from all kinds of failures that will get you to a conference, right? But the problem is you're only as strong as your weakest link. There was a conference once and they said, speaker council, who are you on this afternoon? And the guy turned up and said, well, the first puncture wasn't a problem. <laughs> right. It's the second puncture was the real problem. And that's what put us at the side of the road for a few hours. Right? They got two punctures that ran over a bottle or whatever. It took out two, both, both tires in one go. Right. So you're as, weak as, you're, you're as strong as your weakest link. And I think what we can do is build a sort of taxonomy to have common language terminology, definitions, and that helps mitigate communication failure between people working on this and there's some proposals on how to do this, and I'm gonna skip over some of this because I don't have time today, and it was a bit in the weeds for practitioners. Um, but they're in these different layers. Think of the infrastructure layer as stuff breaking in the, in the hardware. You know, disks fail, networks fail, hardware fails. Software stack is the stuff you bring in. It's your uh, Linux fails, that kind of thing. You have a bug in your operating system and your languages in the layers of software that you bring in from outside that you, or you buy. Applications, the code you wrote, you're trying to build and maintain, you have bugs in that. And then operations is like things like not doing capacity planning right and suddenly discovering that there's 10 times as many customers turning up in this instant in time because you built a, let's say you built a system for running um, conference calls and it turns out 9 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, they all turn up at once. <laughs> and your system that runs perfectly and idle the rest of the time, everyone's trying to start a conference call at the same time and it keels over. It's a true story as well. Um, <laughs> so they fixed it in the end. Um, and then there's different layers. How are you going to get around these things? Um, we've, we've had a lot of approaches around just, I'm just going to replicate all the bits on the disk to somewhere else so that if I need to, I can restart my whole stack on top of that because the data is the thing that matters. And then we got to, well, the database has more structure in it, so instead of shipping every block you changed, you can actually replicate queries and keep the databases in sync. And this is kind of a bit more mainstream now, but, you know, we've seen this with Oracle and MySQL and Postgres. Um, but really, we're seeing more application level where you actually think about what you're doing, and this is where you start trying active-active. Because at application level, you have to be able to balance the traffic. So the way things like Netflix work is really application level replication. The data is being replicated underneath, but the system is steering work to different places, and it's running it everywhere. So if you're running active-active all the way around the world, sort of N plus one failure mode, that, that's kind of what it looks like. So I'm going to look at this, now let's look a bit about the history, the past, present, future of this. In the history, we called this disaster recovery. Right? Now we kind of call it chaos engineering. And I think in future, what we're just trying to do is build resilient critical systems. And you know, we don't really have a name for that, but anyway. And then where does disaster recovery come from? There was this company called Sunoco, the Sun Oil Company in the 70s. And they had a division of Sunoco who wanted to build a guaranteed availability resilient data. Right? That's SunGuard. That's what the name means. Um, and they started this whole idea that you could take your mainframe batch jobs and run them somewhere else and they spun it out, out as a separate company. The company existed until a few years ago when it got bought by somebody. But, and you get these terminology, recovery point, which is basically how often do you do backups? If you do a daily backup, you can only restore to whatever point you did. If you're doing hourly, if you're doing continuous replication, maybe you're replicating second by second or millisecond by millisecond, right? So that's the granularity we can go back to. Then how long does it take to recover? So this becomes kind of the two big, big things that people talk about. And this whole principle, industry built up around business continuity and there are ISO standards around it and there's a glossary which defines all kinds of useful terms and business processes and this is where I invoke my Greenspun's law like go and read the glossary and don't redefine these terms because businesses are already using these terms so that's just like don't ignore the hit the past let's build on it so let's look at chaos engineering um, back in around 2004 Jesse Robbins who some of you may know it's um, he was one of the founders of Chef, and he's currently playing around with a Star Trek communicator company. He's got 
But he was, at Amazon, he was the master of disaster. He used to go around turning off data centers and breaking stuff to, in order to prove that the system kept working. Uh, back in 2010, when I was at Netflix, uh, Greg Ozell, whose Twitter handle is Chaos Simia, it's a bit of a giveaway, um, his, he built the first implementation of Chaos Monkey, and we, it was one of the first things we ever installed in our cloud. And we used it to enforce some, some guide rules that we wanted everything to be a, a auto scaled, and you want to be able to delete any machine and have everything still work. Right? So that was, we did that to start with. We ended up open sourcing that, and that's really when people started thinking, hearing these words, chaos and chaos monkey became quite popular. Uh, Gremlin um, is actually, you know, the founder of Gremlin was at Amazon back in the day, and Amazon still has a chaos engineering team, um, and was also at Netflix, so he, you know, this is where that company comes from. And then eventually Netflix published a book, and the concepts, um, this is the conference, I was talking about the conference last week, but I think it's starting to become a thing. So I thought this was worth talking about to this community here because this is, this is a subject which is starting to bubble up to the level where, where companies are saying, What's your, what are you doing about chaos engineering? And it's kind of like microservices was a few years ago. What are you doing? Why, what is this thing? What does it mean? What is it about? And there's some of the same things. The technologies move on and they enable new ways of working and this is kind of a new way of working. So I'm going to explain very briefly about what this is, and then sort of explain why it matters. So, chaos architecture is this sort of layered thing. So, what it really comes down to is there's an infrastructure layer where you want to make sure everything's duplicated and you can, you can, um, you've got all the replication in place. And there's at least two ways to do everything. There's two ways to get everywhere, and there's at least two copies of the data everywhere. Right? That's the infrastructure layer. And you want to ensure that by going and creating failures in different places to make sure it happens. Then you need to be able to switch traffic between these multiple things, and you have to do that extremely reliably. And this is actually usually the least well-tested part of any infrastructure is the code that switches traffic during an outage, which is why you get a small outage, causes a slightly bigger outage, which causes a cascading failure and everything falls over. And that is such a common thing, because people aren't testing the way that they switch traffic around. Then applications, you know, Send it an error code if it falls over, that's bad. So you want to make sure that applications have some resilience. And you also want to train the people. And the people side, you need to be able to uh, run game days where you practice things going wrong. So this is overall how it looks. And it's also very similar to the red team security model where you have a team that is trying to break into your systems to make sure that your regular security team is doing a good job. So both of these are the idea is a bit, a bit like the ideas in the Anti-Fragile book by Nicholas Taleb, right? You are trying to work the system, you're exercising the system to make it stronger, right? That's the anti-fragility concept. It's not just resilient, which means if you hit it, it'll come back to where it was. It's anti-fragile means if you hit it, it comes back to be stronger than when you hit it. It's like working out, right? If you, if you work out regularly every day, you gradually get stronger, right? So what we're trying to do is break it to make it safer um, there's a whole lot of interesting work going on in safety in general. And this is another point where we don't want to stop reinventing things. The, the safety industry, and Todd Conklin used to, used to run the Livermore Labs nuclear safety, like Los Alamos Labs. New, he was the, in charge of safety for people that are trying to make sure that atom bombs work and they, they simulate them correctly and they have lasers and nuclear stuff lying around. Okay. So he knows about safety. Um, John Osborne has been doing a lot of work in this area, and the Stellar.Report is a URL. The .Report is a rather long domain, but anyway. Um, and Sydney Decker, the book I mentioned, Drift Into Failure. So there's a bunch of interesting stuff coming from industrial safety, like aircraft, construction sites, hospitals, which are entirely relevant to computer systems, especially since computer systems are now managing construction sites and hospitals <laughs> and aircraft. So we're, we're closing the circle and we're taking humans and replacing them with computers and think of that synoptic illegibility problem. If you get the programming wrong, there isn't a human there to interpret what should happen. So there's this whole thing that failures um, that, you know, are, are really a lack of safety margin and that's what's really important. It's not, generally, there isn't a root cause, there isn't human error. When you see those words, get worried that somebody is looking very myopically at the, the nearest possible cause of something rather than the systemic cause, which is the system should have been able to prevent that happening. So we have hypothesis testing. 
That's the experiment. I think we have margin in this dimension. We'll go test it. So what we're trying to get to is experience stuff using robust applications on a dependable switching fabric and a lot of redundant services. And sort of why, why has this come up now? So let's just have a quick look at future directions and I'll wrap up. Um, there's a whole thing, question here about what's the observability of systems and what's a bit about um, epidemic failure modes and a bit about automation. So people have started using this word recently and there's a bit of controversy out on the Twitterverse and people arguing about it. It's another one of those uh, Greenspun kind of things. Um, observability was defined in 1961. It's a control theory term. And it has this really useful definition. Systems observable if the behavior can be determined by looking at its inputs and outputs, including any logging data or internal state information. And um, again, let's go with the full definition. But if you think about a monolith, it's really hard to see what's going on in a monolith. They're not very observable. You put a bit of logging on it, it gets better. You put some tracing in it, now you can see what's happening inside your monolith. But a microservice that does one thing is inherently more observable. It's just more, it's, it's bounded, you can see what's going on. And then if you think about a lambda function, with functions have no side effects. That's the kind of definition of a function. It means there's no internal state. It means if you ask it to do the same thing a million times, it'll do the same thing. You know, one plus one equals two every time you try it. There's no internal state that says, I'm going to secretly add three every now and again, right? Um, so that means that we have better observability on these more fine-grained systems that we're building nowadays as we move to microservices and functions. So that's, that was my point there. And then there's this question about failures. Most failure modeling assumes failures are independent, right? I get a puncture, one tire, okay, good. I don't expect both tire, more than one tire to be punctured at the same time. But it turns out there's a lot of correlated models which are harder to model, and people go crazy trying to work. If two things are allowed to fail, the, the permutational complexity explodes. It's much harder to deal with. And then you get these epidemic failures where everything breaks at once. And here's a few of them. Remember the Linux leap second? Like everyone on the, exactly that patch version of the Linux kernel the machine went, oh, sorry. Um, we're just done. And it happened everywhere at the same time because it was the same leap second everywhere, right? So um, those, are, those are the kinds of things that should keep you up at night because you, you know, if you get really good at automating everything, then everything you have is on the same patch level. And, you, and now, you've just op now you have a, like a wheat field full of the same genetically identical type of wheat and one bug comes along and wipes it out, right? So you have to start saying, well, I'm going to have several fields with slightly different genetic types of wheat in. I'm going to have different variations. Um, so back in the days when I was working at Sun, we had this thing where we shipped a bunch of machines and every now and again, you know, due to some sort of process errors and a few other things, it would flip a bit in the cache and the machines would start crashing randomly and it was just, you know, it was out in the field. It's really hard to fix hardware. Right, so that's another epidemic problem that we had to face. Um, a cloud zone or a region, right? That takes down a hard, large number of, 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 of customers at once. DNS failure I already mentioned. And then security configurations. There was a time when one of the cloud providers you know, missed a semicolon in a security config and took out the entire global network, right? Not happy, not happy day. They fixed it pretty quickly, but you know, it, it took a while to, for everything to come back again because all the traffic suddenly was stopped. So how do you manage <coughs> epidemics? Well. Think of a SARS epidemic. You have quarantine. If you travel in Asia right now, they have these machines at airports that are scanning your body temperature to see if you've got, got flu. Right? They're, they're, they're trying to contain and, and bound these things and quarantine them. So maybe you should be able to deploy your software on Windows as well as, as Linux. Right? It's a JAR file or whatever. It's Java. I can run Java on Linux or Windows. I should make sure that I have a development pipeline that can always deploy on a different version of the operating system or a, even a totally different kernel. And the most different kernel you'll find from Linux is probably Windows. So there's very little code in common, right? So maybe that gives you some diversity that you'd want to do. Maybe one's more efficient than the other, so you always run the most efficient one, but you, you keep this other version going. You maybe try a different number of CPU implementations. You know, back in the day, there was a problem with the Pentium where the floating point number calculations weren't done quite right, and everyone on Pentium had to go figure this out. Um, you want to figure out cross-zone, cross-region replication, figure out how to manage multiple DNS providers, and then make sure your deployments are bounded. Don't never deploy anything globally. There, there was somebody 
responded to the discussion I was having a few years ago, to, to err is human, to err and deploy globally is DevOps. Right? <laughs> so that's, you know, just don't do that. Um, so you basically got to manage it to, to maintain an epidemic. And what we're really doing here, the, the reason this is happening now is that cloud gives you the automation that leads you to chaos engineering. Right? The fact that we can programmatically create everything around the world dynamically, repeatably, gives us that ability. And what we're seeing is that data centers are moving to cloud. These sort of notions they have of data center failover where you have to curate your data centers to be the same and you just, you know, you, work, you practice for forever to make sure, you know, for a month maybe, before you do your failover exercise to make sure, and then while the auditors are watching and you go, oh God, that's over with for a year. That's kind of the normal way disaster recovery is done. There are a few people that do it regularly, but it's really a tiny number. What we're getting to with chaos engineering is that it's automated, it's repeatable, it's reliable. We're taking disaster recovery, we're productizing it, automating it, making it low cost, reliable, and something that you start doing continuously. And I think that this is, this is the key thing, and this is why the chaos engineering topic is starting to bubble up now. It's a combination of people shutting entire data centers that contain critical infrastructure, plus the ability to now automate and manage this and put it all out there. Um, if you want to follow up, there's, there's some interesting work going on at CNCF. There's a working group on chaos. There's a bunch of people gathering around sort of Kubernetes and saying, well, we can come up with common ways of, of introducing various types of failure modes into Kubernetes, Kubernetes-based applications, because there's some common APIs there. And I think that's becoming a forum for people to sort of, like, across the industry to come together to maybe define some terms and build out some technology. And then there's a few startups and open source projects in this space too. So that's what I had. Um, just about on time, I think. Thank you.